Alright, here we go. Are we ready to start? Yep, take it away. All right. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here at another meeting of the Reimagining Public Safety Community Advisory Committee. My name is Tarab Ansari. Uh, I'm here representing San Jose residents who are struggling with mental health, uh, mental health illness or substance use, and I will be facilitating today's meeting. Without further ado, let us begin. Um, we are here to engage in a community-led process that we believe can lead to meaningful recommendation for reform and, and alternatives to policing in our community. Uh, I apologize. I wanna let you know that there is a translation available in Spanish. Uh, if you would like uh, to uh, have translation, please click on the uh, bottom of your screen. And oh, sorry, why is this happening? Sorry, my computer is kind of lagging here. Um, but if you would like translation at the bottom of your screen, you're able to uh, click on the icon to choose between English and Spanish translation. Um, if you're having technical difficulties, please reach out to Laurie Valdez at 408-661-1804. Uh, if you sp uh, speak English, please select the English uh, as your interpretation option now so that you may be able to hear uh, the speakers in Spanish. If you were nominated to serve on this committee by an organization, you should have received an invitation to be a panelist. Uh, if for some reason you joined the meeting uh, and are not a panelist, uh, please, uh, raise your, uh, please raise your hand or um, contact Christopher Logan and he will be able to assist you. Uh, uh, you will receive an invitation to be promoted as a panelist and you will be required to accept this invitation. If you have any other suggestions on how we can make this meeting more accessible, uh, please don't hesitate to email Chris Logan. Uh, his email is on the slide here. Before we begin, it's important that we acknowledge uh, that we host this meeting on the lands of the Muwekna Haloni people who have stewarded this land through the generations. We commit ourselves to partner with our indigenous sisters and brothers to celebrate and honor their legacy in our collective work for justice and in our care for these lands we benefit from today. Um, a today's lived experience testimony will be included in the panelist presentation. Uh, and as such, uh, this item has been tabled unless there is uh, anyone who's against that. Being that there are no objections, uh, the live testimony uh, item has been tabled for next week. Uh, now we will have uh, uh, John present, uh, uh, give us a presentation on the Asian American uh, Pacific Islander community and their uh, recommendations for reform and alternatives for public safety. Thanks, Tarab. I'm assuming you meant Jell Cortez, um, but John is a great name too. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here and share in this community space with, with all of you. My name is Angelica Cortez. Most know me by my nickname, which is Jell. And I work for and with Lead Filipino. We're um, a San Jose-based nonprofit that organizes um, on issues of, of concern and importance for, for Philam communities and larger communities, but you can catch us um, doing a lot of work around grassroots leadership, civic engagement, and our, our big issues are, are really, you know, centered around ethnic studies and, and civil rights work. But I'm, I'm happy to be here. And for the next several minutes, I will be uh, joined by two of my colleagues in community. We're going to, to talk a little bit about, um, and we by no means represent the entire, um, the enriched diversity and the, the breadth of all things that are Asian American Pacific Islander community. We are but three representatives here that actively do work in the San Jose locality on issues of public safety and police accountability. 
uh, multi-generationally with youth, with seniors, with families, with young adults, with college students, you name it, that all care about this issue, that approach this issue from a, a number of different starting points and are called into this work around police accountability uh, because of um, you know, personal, personal experiences, traumas, um, and, and wanting to see changes. So again, we are by no means uh, an exhaustive representation of all the beauties of the AAPI community locally, but we are here today to talk about the work of, of each of our organizations and the, the communities and populations that we work with closely and represent and to share more with, with this committee uh, on local programs and initiatives and efforts that we're doing all around this larger um, you know, body of work around public safety. So really what we hope you'll gain from this is some insights into how we come together and I will introduce our other two panelists in a second, um, but how we come together through different coalitions and through different entities to really mobilize around action. Uh, you'll be hearing from both um, uh, Richard Conda and Mimi Nguyen and we're all active in the Asian Pacific Islander uh, Justice Coalition out of the South Bay with many other organizations on the line here. We come together on, on you know, larger regional, statewide, and national issues of importance to our large and vivacious and beautiful community, especially around anti-Asian um, anti hate crimes, um, uh, instances of assault, and, and really combating just the very harmful narratives that we know uh, abound in the a AAPI community, at least recently too. So I'd like to kind of set that stage and and invite both uh, Richard and Mimi to wave. I'm going to introduce them and we're just going to get started. Uh, how we're going to do this everyone is, um, as Tarab mentioned, our personal testimonies, why we were called into this work, how our respective organizations navigate uh, share resources, amplify stories will be embedded in, in the next several minutes with all of you. But first I'd like to introduce my, my community sister, Mimi Nguyen. She is a San Jose native, born and raised by Vietnamese immigrant parents. As a product of the, of the East Side Union High School District, she went off to receive a BA at the University of California in Davis, then received her JD from Golden Gate University. Mimi has dedicated her career to public interest work she recently stepped into the role as executive director at Step Forward Foundation, where she was formerly a VA Bank Law Fellow. She is grateful for the opportunities that the Vietnamese Bar Association of Northern California, um, v VA Bank, has given to her throughout her legal journey. Mimi serves on both the board of VA Bank and the Vietnamese American Roundtable, known as VAR. In 2020, Mimi and her husband, uh, Vietnam Nguyen, welcomed a beautiful baby girl named Sophia. In her free time, she enjoys um, calligraphing, weightlifting, traveling, and spending time with her family, friends, and two Shiba Inu dogs. Welcome to Mimi. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, Richard Conda, who definitely needs no introduction, but um, I learned a lot about you, Richard, from reading your bio because I don't think I've seen your bio before. <laughs> but um, Richard is a graduate of, of the University of California at Berkeley. He attended law school at Santa Clara University, graduating in 1978, and has worked at the Asian Law Alliance since graduating from law school. He was one of the founding members of ALA. Richard Kondo was an active participant in the movement to obtain redress and reparations for Japanese Americans incarcerated by the US government during World War II. He has received numerous awards and commendations, including recognition by the Santa Clara County Human Relations Commission with the Jim McEntee Lifetime Achievement Award. After the tragic police shooting of Bic Ka T. Tran on July 13, 2003, Honda was active in advocating for justice for the Tran family. He facilitated the formation of the Coalition for Justice and Accountability that continues to advocate for humane police practices. He has been the executive director of ALA since 1994. So welcome to both Richard and Mimi. If you are just joining, um, welcome. Hello. I will be um, your sort of moderator and a speaker this evening. My name is Jell Cortez and I am representing Lead Filipino, 
we're an organization based out of San Jose, California. And to be honest with all of you, I totally overlooked my own bio. But um, some of my hobbies include taking naps, reading and painting. And when I'm not in community and, and working on all things Lead Filipino, you can find me in my other uh, with my other hat on as the VP of Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion with Uplift Family Services. So that's a little bit about me. I'd like to, to turn it over to um, Mimi and Richard to kind of open this conversation. Um, we know that sort of there's this open question of where to begin, right? And I don't think that anyone on the line here as committee members will expect us to, to bring all the answers. But I think what we can provide and offer in this space for all of you is, is really personal testimonies around the organizations that we're representing tonight with all of you and our call to action and some of those beginning stories around our work in public safety and our perspectives as we approach this work. We know that it is multi-layered, it's, it's complex and it's nuanced, but I'd love for us to start there, um, Mimi and Richard, if that's okay. Um, and I'd leave it to, to one of you two to decide who would like to go first, but really just this, this, uh, this open mic around your community and your organization's perspective around public safety. And I know that's definitely not an easy question by any stretch of the imagination, but if we could, if we could start there, sort of maybe talk about your org and then your perspective around how your members, how your families, how are they talking about police accountability? How do they define public safety? I'll start, Mimi. <laughs> so um, you kind of mentioned it in, my, in the intro, um, and I, I can say that prior to Big County Tran being killed by the San Jose police in 2003, unfortunately, a Asian Law Alliance and myself personally we didn't really, we weren't engaged in police accountability work. We just didn't. We were busy doing a lot of other stuff and just, it wasn't on our radar. But after that incident happened, uh, it kind of like was right in our face. And um, I remember a couple of days after the incident, I was getting emails and phone calls from people and they were saying, you know, we, we, we got to do something. This, this is, something is really wrong here. And so for those of you who may not have been around the San Jose area in 2003, what happened on July 13th was a young mom with two kids. Um, the kid, one of the children was running around outside. A neighbor called the police uh, saying there's a kid running around outside. Uh, when the police arrived, um, th actually before the police arrived, the neighbor came to the duplex, which was on Taylor Street. And the child was already inside the, uh, the duplex, but the neighbor, the nosy neighbor heard some sounds coming out of there. So she recalled 911 and said, I think there's domestic violence happening. There's some of these yelling. So, you know, you need to hurry up. So when the police arrived, uh, within seven seconds, uh, Big Kyle was shot and killed. Um, she had a Vietnamese vegetable peeler in her hand. And the San Jose police officer who killed her uh, said that he thought, you know, his life was in danger. And that's why he shot and killed her. Um, she was four feet nine, 90 pounds. He had a bulletproof vest on. It was hard for uh, the community to really understand how this could have happened. And so along the way, there were many protests and meetings and, and the grand jury, which was the process which was used by the district attorney at that time to decide whether criminal charges should be fired, filed against a police officer, um, it was actually opened up by the district attorney who was at that time, George Kennedy, which was a very unusual procedure. Generally, the pre procedure before that was, it was a closed secret grand jury. So we never knew what happened. So we had the opportunity to actually hear exactly what the different witnesses there uh, saw and heard. And so that's why I, I was in the court when uh, uh, the officer who shot and killed her said, you know, I thought she was gonna kill me. There were other off, uh, police officers that were um, expert witnesses who said that 
a sharp edge weapon like she had in her hand, which again was a Vietnamese vegetable peeler, is more deadly than a gun. Because with a weapon like that, with a sharp edge weapon, you don't have to reload, you can keep stabbing. And the, the, the expert witness actually brought in this large knife and in court showed how it was so dangerous. Um, at the end of the process, uh, the officer was not indicted. Uh, we were very disappointed. We thought he should have been indicted. And at least a jury could have decided whether he had committed a crime, but the grand jury decided not to indict him. Um, the community was really concerned about that. And you know, from that, the Coalition for Justice and Accountability Forum, and through the years, we've continued to co monitor police, police activities. And I think the lessons we learned out of this, out of the Tran case were, number one, in a case involving a death where the police officer has killed a citizen, a resident, it's really hard for the, the grand jury or the jury to, to convict or to bring an indictment. It's, you know, he was sitting there in his, in his uniform. They just, they just couldn't do it. Now, I mean, if we reflect back now, this is 2003, you know, maybe there would have been a different result now. And maybe in, in fact, instead of the police going out to the scene, it would have been, you know, bilingual mental health counselors who could have talked to her because, you know, she, she wasn't threatening anybody. And, and the, only, the only person that she was, she, she was just trying to actually open a door with that, with that vegetable peeler. Um, the other thing we learned is that um, it's it's a long game here, and it's it it's it takes a lot of kind of stick to itness to kind of hang in there. And and so uh, I think for for me, um, what I reflect on is that you know I I think there's a lot of things we could have done better, and things that we kind of uh, reflect on that maybe we made some errors. But I think you know. The community at least came together at that point and had a had some understanding of the process. And I'll stop and let Mimi kind of chime in now. So I'm I, I'm gonna kind of backtrack a little bit and talk a little bit about the Vietnamese community, but I'm just gonna preface this with I am not the voice of the Vietnamese community. I'm just I you know I work with the Vietnamese American Roundtable and we've gathered these stories and exp lived experiences. And these are common perspectives that we hear um, within the Vietnamese community. Um, and like Richard and Joel have alluded to that this is just a really complex issue that we're kind of diving into in like 45 minutes, which I don't think we'll get through all of it. But um, I think really understanding how the Vietnamese community feels about law enforcement, we have to really understand the perspective where the Vietnamese community comes from, the historical context, um, that dates back to you know pre-1975 when the Vietnam War happened and April 30th, 1975, the fall of Saigon. So understanding the diaspora of the Vietnamese refugee will provide more context as to like the difference between the generations in San Jose. So after the Vietnamese people were displaced from our home and our country in 1975, um, throughout the first three waves, um, San Jose became one of the largest resettlement areas for the Vietnamese community. And um, one of the things that we really have to think about is how the, that, that generation of people who were refugees really look at law enforcement here versus law enforcement and military in Vietnam. When we look at um, how they felt about the war, these people were displaced from their homes. They were forced to flee um because of the war and so when the older generation is here in the united states what they're looking at is they view they they, they have respect for law enforcement they have respect for um the safety that they feel here um as opposed to the safety that they felt when when they were in vietnam during the time of communism um so understanding that experience and that trauma kind of sets up the tone for the intergenerational um, differences that we see and we focus on today. Um, so uh, I think um, the Vietnamese community can really come together and, um, re and unite, like Richard mentioned, the Bit Gao Tejung incident and then the Daniel Fan incident in 2009, the San Jose community really rallied and protested against law enforcement, held local elected officials, really accountable to their actions. Um, but however, that same generation 
we don't see them standing up and speaking up for other communities and people of colors. And that's just because they don't want to go against the grains. They don't want to talk, um, seem ungrateful for the safety that they're getting from the law enforcement officers. However, like we see the different generations that we're working with today, the younger generation who, who are a little bit more progressive, who understand that there is a certain standard that um, public servants and you know public safety officers should be accountable and held accountable to. Um, and so there's this divide and there's a difference between the perspectives of the, the, the various generations that um, the Vietnamese community experiences. And so as a part of the Vietnamese American Roundtable, we've been really working to really bridge that gap and seeing how do we share the information between the different generations and really have an understanding of where, how can we move towards racial equity and, and social justice within our own community. So we've worked with, you know, the San Jose Police Department, there are cadets. Um, we, we go to their academies and we talk about cultural competency and we do a training with them for every cadet. And we've done this for the last three cadet sessions um, so that there's better understanding between law enforcement um, and what the Vietnamese community here in San Jose really need. Um, the other thing that we've done to kind of bridge that, the gap between law enforcement and the community is held public safety forums so that law enforcement officers can meet the community. And uh, the thing that we've done that I think we do really well is we hold a care corner, kind of a healing session or a dialogue and really creating that narrative between our um, youth and coming up with language to help really um, share with the older generation what, what these new reforms that are needed within the community um, and that finding that language to share that. Um, so those are some of the things that we've been working on um, and we've been getting more involved with the AAPI hate um, incidents as well. And that was really long, <laughs> sorry, Joe. <laughs> No, no worries. I think that this is definitely a free flowing dialogue. And I know that we'll have time um, after we all go around and, and speak a little more in depth with with greater detail around our respective organizations, um, different programs and initiatives and efforts in this space, as, as you touched upon Mimi, I know we'll have time um, to hear from the committee members on the line, as well as anyone else that that would like to weigh in via public comment, we invite the conversation. And I think that both Richard and Mimi, I mean, just to just to add and to continue this discourse, I think it's no surprise uh, what Lead Filipino does. We work with Phil Ams, and we work across the many uh, generations of the different experiences. Again, as we talk about um, the Phil Am diaspora, we know that California has uh, among one of the largest Phil Am populations at uh, one and a half million. Um, in the county of Santa Clara, we have an estimated 150,000. We're still awaiting some of the, the new 2020 census data to tell us how our numbers have shifted, have they increased, have they decreased um, with respect to the city of San Jose. But, but I think, as Mimi said it, to really understand how these conversations and how these perceptions and attitudes take different shape in our community, you definitely need to consider the influences of, of our immigration stories. And at the time, especially with the, the older, the seniors that we work with, the traumas uh, around coming from the Philippines, I mean, is one thing, but also considering the, the governmental regime of that time. And I'm only speaking from the perspective of, of lead Filipino, of course, but you know, many of the seniors that we interact with and that we build with and work on a lot of our public awareness campaigns around came from a, 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 an era of martial law in the Philippines, highly militarized student activists um, during a time where any, any type of speaking out or defying that authority uh, when martial law was imposed, there was a true fear and there were um, student activists, uh, 
families, individuals, advocates that spoke out, and I'm talking during a time in the Philippines, um, during the you know 70s and 80s, that uh, this was rampant and this was real, where people went missing, and people were exiled from the country for speaking out and and really practicing what we would say in, in this Western context is, you know, would be our civil rights to, to practice our, our free speech and to share our opinions. And so with these traumas, with these experiences, um, when you extend that conversation into, again, the very rich and real stories and experiences around our immigration, um, our immigration paths and, and you bring those conversations into Phil Am settings, you definitely get you get a lot of reluctance, you get a lot of resistance. If we're talking with the seniors, not wanting to rock the boat, not wanting to to decry or disavow or be public with one's political beliefs, because more times than not, we know that our ideologies on on different societal needs, public needs, how public resources are allocated. If we're talking about taxpayer dollars, we're talking about police accountability, you know, that's that's locking into someone's viewpoints on how how we engage in this social contract. And so some of our seniors don't have the appetite. Um, they don't want to talk about it. But that same reluctance, I think, is is definitely extended into uh, you know many of the other issues that that lead Filipino works on but i think with the seniors that we interact with and that we build with they can agree that the that violence whatever the case may be should not be met with violence we should this is healers work this is rehabilitation this is um the work of, of de-escalation, this is the work of restoration. And so when we have these conversations with our families or with second, now coming third generation Philams, um, some of them have not been to the Philippines. Some of them do not cook Filipino food or do not understand pop culture references that are very firmly planted in the Philippines, it creates a, you know, a level of variability, not just in, um, you know, opinions and perceptions, but, but even around intended action that lead Filipino should take. So if we're having a conversation with our youth and with our young adults and college folks, they're definitely of the defund, defund the police, divest to reinvest uh, resources, they're definitely of that paradigm. And there have been so many instances that I care to admit that in these conversations are good when they happen, but we're having a, a meeting across our membership. You know, we as lead Filipino are, are doing a lot of work around, um, you know, cultural preservation, the recent historic naming of the Delano Monongs Park in over on the east side of San Jose on the corner of Capitol and Jamelli Way right near that target in Wiener Schnitzel. Um, you know, we are involved in a lot of other initiatives that are really uplifting, not just our, our civic work, but also how we're, you know, showing up for other communities as well on these um, issues of social importance. But because of that, we do, we do interact with, you know, um, <clears throat> a very rich multi-generational uh, membership base. And more times than I care to admit, our young folks will say things that make the older folks blush. And these conversations get emotional, especially when, when we're talking about sort of all these intersections at which we work that we're navigating around anti-Asian hate, um, educating our members on a hate crime versus a hate incident, uh, showing video clips, reading poetry, really trying to create spaces where we're processing together and making meaning. But then you're trying to answer for the, all these different ages, all these different experiences. Um, you know, we've had, different meetings where one of our, um, in this particular instance, a mom was really offended by one of our young folks. Um, that was definitely of the abolitionist viewpoint. And this young person was very unabashed and we support everyone being their, their true selves and asking questions and sharing information and engaging. But this mom, she lost her cool because her husband is a correctional officer and started yelling and screaming. And of course, we had to take a break in a Zoom setting. But these are very real emotions. 
and how do you have these conversations but also show your members ways to get involved what do you do with that energy and so i'm going to talk a little bit more about how how we as lead filipino you know we work very locally we're based out of san jose but we're involved in regional and statewide coalitions and i want to talk more about the justice for angelo quinto justice for all coalition that we joined last year which was really our call as as a grassroots organization into into joining this larger this larger outcry for real radical and true change to our to our law enforcement agencies and and also the work that we did to support um you know ab 988 the the lifeline act the miles hall lifeline act and the work that we continue to do with the miles hall foundation and the other advocacy that we did around the decertification process that the state of california just signed into law as well but i'd like to yeah take a break and um see if, if mimi or richard have any comments on sort of your org's perspective in this work before we move into kind of going deeper into those details on yeah what your orgs are specifically doing right now in this area so i just kind of want to open it for any reflective comments before we transition to our next topic i'll just chime in joe and, and mimi it yeah the, it's it's complicated i mean i've had some long debates with some of my board members even about especially about you know anti-asian hate anti-asian hate crimes and you know what's the correct response it's like punish 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 or is it heal is it look look from the victim's point of view uh it's not an easy conversation so it's it, it's hard yeah yeah I, I'm going to echo that as well. I think within the Vietnamese community, we're still trying to figure out how do we have these conversations? What does the discourse look like? Um, how do how do we narrate it in a way that is digestible and understandable for um, the, the different generations? So I think it's very, the, the theme is very common. It's really complex. It's really hard. These are hard, hard and taboo conversations to have. Um, so I, I think I would agree with you both. Yeah. But I think the, you know, the fact that we're creating spaces that invite the conversation and we don't ostracize. I mean, granted, I'll be the first one to admit here that I have very strong viewpoints on, on changes that if I had a magic wand would happen yesterday. Um, but these, these responsibilities we hold as, as leaders in our respective community-based, you know, and nonprofit service providing organizations, having that conversation to move it forward while not ostracizing or excluding and inviting different perspectives. I'm sure we've lost members. I'll say that. I'm sure people have walked away from us because of certain conversations we've had and our public material that we put out but we definitely need to come out and be strong with our positions on these things. Um, you know, take your pick, right? Um, and when I say these things, of course, I'm talking about in the context of, of police accountability work. So not everyone's ready for it. That enters the doors of lead Filipino. Um, and we've had a lot of very emotionally charged conversations. Some of us relish in it. Others just never come back. So that's also a real, a real part of this uh, work. But I'd like to kind of now move our conversation into our kind of closing piece, <clears throat> which is hearing from both of you um, around different initiatives and efforts and programs. I know maybe you mentioned that you've worked with now three cohorts of, of cadets at the city of San Jose. Um, with their police department would love to hear more about that, you know, cultural responsiveness and, you know, the deliverance of relevant services training that you do um, with them with regard to the Vietnamese community. And yeah, Richard, any anything that you'd like to uplift here that the Asian Law Alliance is doing in this space? So I'll leave it to both of you to decide who wants to go first. Well, I'll jump in first again. Maybe. Uh, so uh, I'll start locally here with San Jose Police. So I have many people may or may not know the city council approved recently the uses of license plate readers. And um, there's some concerns about that and as far as privacy and you know, retention and you know, what do the companies that gather this information, who do they share it with? 
So we're trying to gather up some people and think about how we might have conversations with San Jose Police Department as they move forward because the city council has already approved it. So we're trying to figure out ways to at least have some oversight or regulation of that. So that's one piece locally. The second thing kind of go, goes towards the stop AAPI hate work. Um, we've been working with a lot of other organizations and specifically with assembly member Ting. He's recently introduced AB 1947. It's called Freedom from Hate Crimes. And really what it does is it, it's based on the 2018 state auditors report that found that law enforcement um, was not adequately identifying, reporting, or responding to hate crimes. And so the, this, this bill would, would uh, require that law enforcement agencies adopt a hate crimes policy with specific guidelines, which really does, does not exist right now. In fact, there's many law enforcement agencies that they report zero hate crimes, which is hard to understand given the, the upsurge of hate crimes. I know locally there have been reports, but there are some smaller cities throughout California that report like zero. I think like the city of Anaheim had zero, which I can't believe. So anyway, this, this is something that I'll probably be reaching out to some of you folks to see if you might want to join some of the organizations that are also supporting this bill. And I'll stop now and hand it to you, Mimi. Um, so I'll, I'll just respond to Jill's question um, regarding the San Jose Police um, Academy, the cadet um, cohorts. So with uh, VAR, we come in and we pretty much give a historical background and context as to, you know, the Vietnamese community, what it looks like, you know, what we're made of and, and who we are um, and, and, you know, just our rich culture here in San Jose. We also do an implicit bias training with the cadets because we feel that that's really important, especially um, with the current, you know, era that we're in with a lot of profilings, a lot of expectations. We talk about over-policing in certain areas um, that, that is heavily populated by the Vietnamese community, um, how to build relationship with community members. Um, and we find that that's really important at least to have that conversation and hopefully have the officers who, when they're starting with a certain ideal, to carry that ideal you know, with them throughout you know, their career. Um, so that's something that we've been working on and, um, you know, we've been getting pretty good feedback from the cadets. So we're, we're really proud of that. Um, we've been trying to get it. We've been working with the um, just AAPI Justice Coalition and getting more involved with the AAPI hate and really like we want to share with the community. What do, what's the difference between hate incidents? What's the difference between a hate crime and the Vietnamese community oftentimes fail to report, and it's very common within the AAPI community, but it's that encouragement to report so that we have, you know, accountability, so that we have the proper statistics and data that we need, um, you know, to have these bills and, and pass in legislation. So those are some of the things that we've been focusing on. Um, and like I said, the Vietnamese community really varies on their idea of what reform looks like. And that's not really a good answer or really good perspective, or I don't know how helpful that is, but that, that's just you know, what we experience in our community. No, I thank you both. And, and I know that we're coming up on our time here and, and we have a, a busy, I mean, the committee has a packed agenda for the evening, but, but what I'll say is sort of in, in closing and to respond to both Richard and Mimi's um, you know, points that they shared, you know, we're all called into this work for a variety of reasons. We see ourselves in the victims. We are close with one of the families that goes through uh, an unbearable and an unthinkable tragedy due to senseless, wicked, aimless violence. We have, you know, again, a loved one we feel or see ourselves in, in some part of that larger equation. And for Lead Filipino, we really stepped into this work last year in a, in a deep, in a deep and very involved way when we joined the statewide now national coalition for the Justice for Angelo Quinto, um, Justice for All campaign. Um, I'll drop a link in the chat box, but a brief story about Angelo Quinto is a former Navy veteran. He he had bouts of depression and, and paranoia, so he had mental health 
issues, um, suffering from PTSD. He, on the evening of December 23rd, 2020, um, had a bout of paranoia and his mom and sister um, rushed to calm him down before his mom came home because she worked an evening shift. It was just him and his sister at home and he was frantic and he was worried that certain um, he didn't want to walk by windows and he started going into a, a panic and he was a bigger gentleman and he grabbed his younger sister and, and held her tight. It scared her enough to call 911 as she was fearful for her safety and his. And by the time uh, the four officers showed up right before midnight, Angelo's mom had already arrived home. We, they were all in their pajamas. This is, you know, two days before Christmas. And uh, his mom, who we call Tita, Auntie Cassandra, had already hugged him, soothed him. He was calm. The four officers that responded proceeded to, to apprehend Angelo, threw him on his stomach, pretzeled him up, and used the knee to neck, um, the, the knee to neck restraint on him for close to six minutes. We have strong evidence um, that we've collected, you know, through this past year of our advocacy to believe that he had. Um, that he had passed away in their home at the hands of these officers. And so to kind of fast forward that Lead Filipino was one of a handful of, of Philam nonprofit organizations that helped circulate a change.org petition that amassed 34,000 signatures. Angelo's story was covered by all the major media uh, publications that you can think of, the New York Times, um, the Washington Post, ABC, CNN, um, even like, I want to say like Hollywood insider, because I was tagged on an Instagram post, um, you know, really with these headlines around the same tactic, the same brutal tactic that was used on George Floyd was used on uh, this gentleman named Angelo Quinto. And we not only had a very strong local response because this happened in the city of Antioch, it did not happen in the city of San Jose, but why I raise it here is because it, it really catapulted lead Filipino San Jose based org into these um, local and statewide conversations. We advocated for a year through our coalition and in, in back in September of 2021, Governor Newsom signed AB 490, the Justice for Angelo Quinto Act, which bans uh, need and neck holds or positional asphyxia uh, to be used by any law enforcement officer, which went into effect January 1st. It also criminalizes the use. So if an officer decides that's the only tactic to use to de-escalate a situation, then, then he could, uh, he, she, they could face um, uh, criminal charges. So we do this work, um, not just, you know, of and for the Philam community, but to build uh, our cross-racial and multi-ethnic solidarity with everyone and anyone that has lost a loved one due to aimless, um, you know, violence and to, and to keep our, um, you know, systems of, of law enforcement and police accountable in this. So I mentioned there are other laws. I, I love that Richard, you know, mentioned this other bill that was just introduced, but I, I do want to uplift right now AB 988, the the Miles Hall Lifeline Act. We should get more when we dial 911, not just a police car, an ambulance or a fire truck. We should have, um, you know, crisis management, de-escalation services when anyone in our community is experiencing a mental health crisis. So AB 988 is a number that you can dial in California now to be directed to, um, you know, mental health, licensed mental health practitioners and professionals. And also SB2 was a law that was passed last year at the state level to establish in the state of California, a decertification process for any police officer that has uh, convictions of misconduct. Misconduct can fall in the categories of coercion, intimidation, uh, evidence tampering, sexual misconduct and abuse of power. And it would, through this law, it not only creates a pathway to decertify um, it creates a pathway for any resident that feels it, that their civil rights were violated to have a path to justice. And further, it um, disallows or disables a police officer that has any prior um, misconduct conviction to, to go and get hired up at another jurisdiction in California. And this will all be public record as well. I know that that was very painful for a lot of folks that were uh, you know, opposed to SB2, that this information is public. Um, but, but I feel more transparency than not is the way to go. Definitely. If we're, we're really about accountability and, and bringing about these changes. So thank you everyone. I know we've definitely exceeded our time. 
we appreciate um, we appreciate the time and space and to have been welcomed. Thank you to uh, Mimi Nguyen with the Vietnamese American Roundtable and to Richard Conda with the Asian Law Alliance. I am Jill Cortez with Lead Filipino, and I think we're at time. Thank you so much, uh, Jill, Mimi, and Richard for um, your experience, your your the recollection of your experiences. Uh, I think something that I took away from this was was that there's tough conversations to be had in our communities and it's and it's not necessarily that there's a you know a one size fits all recommendation we have different voices and different opinions and you know we have to continue having these tough conversations um and so we're going to open the floor uh for public comment first from panelists um who would like to either ask um you know committee members who would like to ask the panelists today any questions or if they have um you know, any comments on how do we feel about what we heard today and how it affects our work um, or if you uh, or any policy recommendations you hear that you think might be uh, help the community we're focusing on today. So if there's a recommendation that your committee has that you think might be re relevant to this. Um, so without further ado, if you would like to um, ask a question or uh, give public comment, please raise your hand and then I will um, call on speakers uh, based on the order. Uh, so first we have uh, Poncho. You may unmute yourself. I think uh, Sparky had, had oh, her hand up. Sorry. Sparky, you may unmute yourself. I'm unmuted, right? You hear me? Um, I wanted to make a couple of comments. As people know, I've been around here since the 80s. And when we're talking about new immigration, I remember back in the 80s when we had the huge wave of Vietnamese coming in, Bill Wilson Center was part of writing a manual uh, for social services because they were arresting and charging so many Vietnamese families uh, with child abuse because they were doing health uh, practices that they had like coining, uh, which was considered uh, using a hot coin to help heal their kids. And basically what was happening is they were charged with abuse. So there was a lot of education that needed to happen in the early days, even with sort of older Vietnamese families coming in about this isn't abuse, it was just a practice and how when you came to the US, you had to change some of your practices. Um, and we wrote this manual. Now you look at it, it's so outdated, but in the 80s, it was seen as progressive. But I also wanted to point out that Richard, I really appreciate what you've been doing for decades here um, because you've really taught me a lot and taken a leadership role in this stuff. Uh, but the one thing I also wanted to point out that. on the juvenile justice side is when we were looking at really going into the numbers of who was in juvenile hall. It was the large percentage of Samoan population when we were cutting into the Asian population in the hall. And I didn't know if any of the panelists had any comments specifically around Samoan population and involvement with law enforcement. Sparky, yeah, I'm so glad you raised that. And I think it's, uh, Pacific Islander is kind of their PI, but a lot of times it's the forgotten community. Um, we've been trying to develop stronger relationships with that community, and and, and I agree. There's there's impacts, uh, disproportionate impacts for the Pacific Islander Samoan community for sure, and something we we need to really pay attention to. Thanks for bringing it up, Sparky. Thank you for your uh, comments, Sparky. If you could lower your hand, thank you. Next, we will have a comment from a Poncho. And then I believe we have uh, somebody who will be putting a timer up. Thank you. You have two. Hi, I, this is more of a question back at the panel. I uh, really appreciate your incredible like leadership and, and the perspectives that, that you're trying to represent, you know, from, you know, from your community and the work that your organizations are doing. But, but I'm, um, I'm really curious if there are additional policy recommendations that you think are, would be really important and salient I know there's state legislation that you've talked about and some other things, but I'm curious if um, any of the things, given the um, the, uh, the different perspectives, generational perspectives in, in communities, and the fact that there have been some progress made 
um, in certain regards, but also the world is uh, world is changing. And, and I'm curious, you know, from the perspective of the panels that just shared, what may be some of the things we would want to pay attention to, either priority recommendations or considerations as we're crafting um, uh, recommendations for reform um, at, at the present time? I'll jump in real quick, Poncho. I mean, from the Asian Alliance perspective, we'd be, we'd be full in support of the different kind of proposed charter amendments in terms of oversight and all of those wide range of things. Those, those make a lot of sense to us. And obviously, you know, developing alternative responses so that, you know, police don't go out when it should be trained mental health counselors, trained uh, bilingual mental health counselors, folks who are culturally competent. I mean, we don't really want to, I, I mean, police really shouldn't be doing that work. So I think we're in full support of that as well. Yeah, I, I would kind of bounce off of Richard's um, uh, sending out um, alternative response to um, the community. I think language access is huge within the community. And, there's definitely a need for that. Um, cultural competency um, trainings, um, not just for the Vietnamese community, but for the AAPI community. San Jose is just so diverse. We're so rich in different cultures and there's just a lack of understanding of the different cultures that are here. Even though Asian people may look the same, the, the reaction from law enforcement should be different um, in each of those instances. I would say, um, Mental health and trauma is a big thing within the AAPI community. And um, I would say officers need training and they, they need to be paired up with someone who really understands how to deal and de-escalate in certain type of situations where law enforcement may not even be needed. Um, so I think those are some of the things that would be very beneficial for the AAPI community. Thank you very much, Mimi, for your thoughtful response. We will now be going to Kiana. Oh, yeah, I actually wanted to make a comment. Yeah, uh, to Kiana, we, you have two minutes. Oh, sorry, thank you. I thought you were going to public comment. Um, hi, everyone. I just have a, um, just a quick comment. I wanted to say that um, historically in the United States, oppression has always been inclusive. There have always been communities of color apart of these oppressive, oppressive white supremacist institutions like the police force. And moving forward, um, I urge us all to consider recommendations that move away from that standard and not to join these institutions, but to think outside of that box. Um, that is my only comment. Thank you very much, Kiana. Are there any other comments from committee members or even uh, from uh, advisory members as well? Seeing that there are no comments from uh, committee members or advisory members, I as the chair would like to make a comment. Um, thank you very much for your, um, for your presentation today. I think you touched on a very tough topic as, as maybe you talked about that this generational differences it's hard to encapsulate it, but it's very important to address. Um, and, and you also talk about mental health. And so the reason, uh, the question I have for you is that in the next, I think six months, I wanna say uh, by mid 2022, Santa Clara County will have the Trust Community Mobile Response Program. Uh, it'll be operating in three locations in the county. So this is a program that is a true alternative to policing. Um, you know, it, it responds to low acuity calls nonviolent calls, but there is a peer mentor uh, with lived experience, you know, a mental health specialist and an EMT. Um, and this program will have, you know, independent call centers. But what is important is that our communities trust these, th this new system that we have. Um, and it's important that we, you know, that that call system builds trust. And there is a component of that program to build trust. Um, but it's something that I wanted to bring to your attention, because I believe that you know, your organizations are at the forefront of this. And um, I think, uh, you know, your organization will have a pretty important role in, in kind of building your community's trust so that they can go out and feel safe using this new program. Because just because there's a new program doesn't mean that, you know, people feel safe reaching out to it. They, you know, they kind of have to be guided to it by community leaders. Um, and so that is something that I hope, you know, your community organizations will take up as well. Thank you. 
Oh, and we have a comment from Lori Valdez. Uh, Lori, you may unmute yourself. Hi, thank you for that. Hi, Richard, haven't seen you in a long time. Anyways, I had a comment as far as, um, so how, how, much, how many times or like, have you ever reached out to an impacted AAPI member by police violence in your community to maybe share with your organizations? Because um, there's a lot of families here in San Jose and there's a lot of AAPI uh, families too who've been abused, who've been left um, paraplegic, who've been, you know, left with brain damage that I think their families can help shed light and bring that to your, um, you know, to your organizations to um, get those hard conversations started. Um, I think it's important that um, every organization who thinks about public safety that you get to um, know the people, the, the people, the people, the families in your own backyards and know their stories and engage with helping them as well. Um, because this is locally work, uh, local work. And also about the SB2, I have one question. For decertifying, who decides, who has the deciding vote of how, when an officer gets decertified, who is made up of that panel? And are any of the people who are making those decisions impacted members of the community? That's an excellent question, Lori. And it's definitely one that I'll have to, to dig deeper and, and share details with the the staff of the committee, but what I can say right now is that there is a commission. There is a commission at the state level that receives the claims and, and votes upon engaging in a, an investigation. I want to say the commission is composed of um, uh, retired law enforcement officers as well as advocates, you know, families that have lost uh, loved ones or have experienced. Um, you know, police brutality. So there, it's a composition of um, sub subject matter experts, families that have been um, afflicted, and law enforcement officers. And in terms of the appointment process and who decides that, it's definitely a state, a state administered body. And I don't know the, the procedures there, but but it's a it's a commission. Now, um, now I feel this way. So do you think from your perspective, do you think it's appropriate to have people that are retired law enforcement that have that, that mindset, like, you know, this is their, their profession, they stick behind the blue boys, right? Um, for those kind of for those people to be part of these decision making tables, um, when we know that when police police themselves or whenever anything happens like that, nothing is done. So therefore, either it's a retired whatever, um, shouldn't we be pushing for um, people who aren't POA, retired police, but people who are really looking for real public safety and transparency? Because um, at this rate, all these bills that get passed and then we have police on them, they're not going to get past the police ever. And so, um, you know, it's important to make sure that the people, the voices of those impacted are at the forefront, right? They're the ones making the decisions. They're the ones that are gonna say, yeah, this guy has done a lot because they're the ones that are gonna go and do the investigation because the police will never do it. They're not gonna make themselves look bad, but it's just, it's just common sense, I guess, for the state to understand. We don't go asking child molesters to be part of a panel to see how we're gonna um, charge them. Right, so this not should not be with police also. Thank you very much for your comment, Lori. Um, are there any other uh, comments from panelists, uh, committee members or advisory members? Seeing that there are none at this moment. Uh, oh, we do. Uh, Mary, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, just uh, Sí, muy, muy buenas tardes a todas. Moment, Miren, please. hay un punto, hay un punto que pienso que no se ha tocado. Eh, muy cierto en lo que estábamos, a que estaban hablando hace como unos 20 minutos, las culturas, las culturas de cada uno son muy diferentes. Aquí lo que necesitamos un punto en lo que se está hablando es la equidad, la igualdad para todos, porque nosotros también como latinos, latinos sufrimos muchas uh, con, las consecuencias de por el idioma. A veces las diferentes culturas nos hacen ver la manera de, de que no entendemos leyes a veces, los que no están involucrados o a veces somos atacados por diferentes, ¿verdad? 
diferentes a culturas que tal vez por el idioma no nos sabemos entender. Y yo lo he vivido, se los digo por experiencia, pero siempre mi contestación es buscar, investigar cuál es, cuáles son los reglamentos para nosotros, cómo educarnos, cómo educarnos como comunidad latina. Porque llegamos aquí, somos inmigrantes y desconocemos muchos de nuestros derechos. Aquí deberíamos de también haber una enmienda sobre los derechos de cada cultura y entiendo que nuestra cultura es muy diferente en nuestro país y llegamos aquí y para nosotros es todo diferente. Es un punto que no se ha tocado. Yo siempre he dicho la igualdad y la equidad y que no seamos, que no seamos a, como siempre, nuestra, quedemos atrás como latinos por el miedo. Hay el, el hecho de que nosotros no, des, no conozcamos nuestros derechos y, no te, y pensemos o por miedo, digamos, oh, mi voz no cuenta. Es algo que, que hemos aprendido que nuestra voz cuenta. Porque en, la, en lo que hemos experimentado en nuestro camino en estos años aquí, podemos decir, oh, mi experiencia ha sido esta, pero también necesitamos un reglamento donde haya igualdad, igualdad de equidad para todas las culturas. Este punto es la clave para que todos podamos opinar, porque todos hemos vivido tal vez diferentes situaciones. Esta es mi manera de pensar en algo que sí nos hace falta. Gracias. Thank you, Mary, for sharing your experiences on, on um, are you sharing your comment on the experiences of the, the Latin community um, and their struggles with, uh, you know, language barriers. And I believe it's something that, you know, we as a city and county should continue working towards. Uh, uh, at this moment, any last comments from panelists or advisory members? We're going to have public comment uh, for the sake of time. We're going to leave public comment towards the end, and we're going to continue with our meeting. So our next, we're going to have subcommittee reports, beginning with the steering committee. Um, some of these committees may not have anything to report. Um, so do we have any report from the steering committee? Right, I believe the steering committee will be meeting at 4 p.m. Uh, on Friday. Uh, moving on, we have the Police Accountability and Reform Committee. Um, is there a spokesperson for the for the subcommittee to give public to give comment? Hi, this is Sandra Asher. I don't know if uh, Ihoma is on uh, as well. She can add to anything. Um, my our update is that we did hold our first um, public feedback session uh, this week and presented about half of our recommendations and received some great feedback from the public um, and we have a second session scheduled towards the end of the month um, to go over the additional recommendations from our committee and that's my update Thank you very much, Sandra. I'm looking forward to seeing what the recommendations or feedback are from the community on the recommendations. Okay, so this was a clerical error, so I apologize. Um, this agenda item was actually on last the last meeting agenda and accidentally got uh, cloned onto this agenda. Um, per the uh, Per Robert's rules of order, if a if an agenda item does not receive a second, it automatically dies on the table. Um, so so as long as there are no seconds for this, we may you know pass over this clerical er error. Seeing that there are no seconds to this motion, this motion fails to move on. We shall now receive a report from the Promotion and Prevention Subcommittee. Um, the spokesperson, please unmute yourself. Yeah, to, um, to Rob, I don't think um, anyone's here from the subcommittee, but just to note on the set, next slide, uh, they'll be having their um, their open forum for comments and feedback on their recommendations February 22nd at uh, 6 o'clock. And, and this uh, is a public meeting, correct? So yeah, this is a public meeting, and I'll be sending an email out to the email list uh, uh, later on tonight. All right. So... Um, now, as you know, the, the draft recommendations are available on the, the Excel sheet. 
Um, so please do take some time to read over it before uh, going to the listening session for the promotion and prevention subcommittee. Um, all right. And we have a received report from the Alternative to Safety Response Committee. Um, I am on this committee, but is there a committee member that would like, a subcommittee member that would like to speak? This is uh, Reverend Sammy. I think you're doing great, Tarab. If All you right, so, give... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say if you wanted to give the report. All right, so for uh, the Alternative Safety Response Committee, uh, we are right now scheduling, we're trying to find a time because we, we kind of have very little overlap uh, in availability, but we are scheduling a time for our listening session. Um, and, and then we, our last kind of recommendation will be up this week as well. I apologize, uh, my internships have been pulling a lot of time for me. Um, but I actually have a report from me as a member of this subcommittee to the greater committee. Um, I had a chance to speak with a policy aide at the county um, for, for one of the county's board of supervisors who's mentioned that uh, the public safety and justice committee within the, the county's board of supervisors is doing work that is, is parallel to ours, but at the county level. And so um, the policy aid uh, recommended that, you know, when our committee finishes its work, that we sub formally submit a, a copy of our report to, to the public safety and uh, justice committee within the board of supervisors so that they are aware of our recommendations and can you know, can keep on, can continue the work at the county level. So I think that was a great offer and it's something that I'll bring up with the steering committee as well. I'm sorry, but I think you're, you're talking, but you're on mute. I'm sorry, Mike, I think my computer is a little glitchy today. Um, I was gonna say public, com we're now open for public comment, which will be limited to one minute. Um, so members of the public, um, if you have any, uh, any comment to give, please raise your hand and you'll be called upon to unmute yourself. And to wrap a uh, clarification, this is for the subcommittee reports, correct? Or this um, in general? This is in, in general. We're open, this is, we're open to open forum now. I, I actually had a question. I know I, I don't typically don't uh, contribute to this meeting, but I know Jell is still on. We have some other individuals who are from the um, AAPI community. One of the things I've been really interested in, and I'll make sure to um, keep this really short, um, is intersections. And so I heard some really interesting echoes even between our committee member, Mary, um, and these, these, the language barrier um, and, and uh, the fear to speak up. Uh, I heard some interesting echoes between, between those two communities. I heard a really interesting echo around the fear of reporting um, and something that I've been really following closely, domestic violence and public safety. And not to equate those two situations, but again, really interesting echo. Um, and I just met with an organizer in Berkeley who's Chinese American who, who said, why don't um, Asian Americans and, and Black Americans talk about um, their experiences of being targeted and um, discrimination and stereotyping? Um, and so I don't know if you're able to comment, Jill, or, or anyone else that, on the committee, but um, just really interested in just like, what are, what are some other ways that um, these issues intersect for across our communities so that we um, can get over this, uh, the cultural barriers that um, prevent us from moving the conversation forward. I mean, that was, that's definitely a, um, that's a, that's a great question, Chris. And I think the response is like everything, um, will involve, um, many layers and and to be honest right now i'm i'm thinking i don't have an answer but i just didn't want to leave this line silent but i'm being truthful that i'm, I'm still kind of kicking that around 
Maybe I'll, uh, oh, sorry, Ponjo, I see you have your hand up too. Oh, I, I just wanted to maybe chime in for a, a quick second. I know Mimi has left, but I, I feel like there is a stigmatization and stigmata are like very prevalent issues across AAPI communities. And, you know, as much as the AAPI community is diverse, diverse I think this, this issue of um, saving face, not kind of airing out dirty laundry or um, not bringing what's happening in, in the home, whether that be these other intersectional issues of violence, like domestic violence, and um, in, it's similar to in the case for uh, Angelo Quinto, right? Like it, there is, there's quite a, a leap of faith um, that can or cannot happen when when talking about uh, when do Asian American families reach to look to the authorities for help and support that they wouldn't otherwise be able to find in the family, um, and and when they do take that leap of faith. For better or for worse, oftentimes it's it's um, the last resort, and that feeling of whether it's a last resort or not, I think, comes from, um, yeah, the, the the fear of being marked in the community as lesser than, right, um, or or feeling that you need to save face or save uh, social status, um, that whatever is going on in your family that may not be to be re may not be able to be resolved in conventional means, um, through through traditional means. Uh, would lessen your value as a as a human being or as a member of the community. So I think being able to address that um, in a culturally competent way, and then Chris, you also brought up um, linguistic uh, linguistic difference, right? And and, and cultural competency. I, I feel like, I mean, we don't we don't talk about um, even the the examples that Richard um, and Mimi had given had given earlier were about Vietnamese families. In Vietnamese families, we don't talk about the police. We don't talk about the authorities. Um, we we definitely don't talk about mental health. Right, so I think a part of our outreach and approach might be to think about avenues of or opportunities of how to have these conversations in in language. Um, how we do that, I'm I'm not so sure yet, and how we do that in an intersectional way to talk about these issues that are particularly stigmatized, I'm also not so sure yet. But it's it's going to take a hell of a lot of effort to to do. Thank you, Philip Poncho. You may mute yourself. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Atrab. Um, one, uh, uh, one comment and question that I have and something that may be useful for a couple of the committees, both the uh, Promotion and Prevention Committee and, and the Alternatives, um, has to do with the fact that uh, I, I heard from the city manager the, um, this afternoon that the city is actually creating a, um, a temporary um, deputy city manager you know, position whose focus is going to be looking at homelessness and some of the issues in coordinating the work and responses of different bodies within the city. And I, I don't know if, um, if Chief Mata, if you have any, you know, if you have any intelligence in terms of what that represents, in terms of, you know, thinking about like different administrative or different types of service functions that the city is doing, um, or if we have any other expertise, if anyone knows anything about it. So I just pose that as as kind of a as a comment, as a, as a question, as a potential, is it a source of potential opportunity for there to be different ways of being able to do that, and not putting that responsibility in on on the shoulders of law enforcement or other other bodies to try to respond to different types of situations? Um, if there's any context around that. So I, I, know, I, oh, I do not have any information on that. That's um, first I've heard of it. Yeah, I just I would like to just pose that as one thing that we may want to do a little bit of research on. I know um, uh, I know Trob, your committee is going to be bringing forward um, uh, like your, your study session um, sometime, hopefully hopefully in the next week or so. Um, it'd be really good for us to um, I'll, we'll see if we can find some additional information about that. And also, um, Chris, when is the um, the next meeting happening um, for the for promotion of prevention? Is that is that next Tuesday? Yep, the 22nd at 6 p.m. Peter, did you have any information about, about that role or that position? Oh, unfortunately, I don't um, know much more than what you said, but if there's any interest in it, I can certainly find a contact for you guys to so just let me know. Great, thank you. I'd, I'd like to very much, especially if these things can like mirror, uh, marry up, that would be really helpful for, for our, our proposals. Thanks. Actually, thank you for that information. I know the that Kiana and Sparky have have worked on a, a recommendation on alternatives to a response that is specific to the unhoused community. 
Um, and, and given this information, I definitely think it's important for us to follow along with it because it, it, it might be that that recommendation is something we highlight then given that this position is opening. Um, so that recommendation is ready to be presented during our next listening session. So it'll definitely be on there. Um, and, but yeah, any additional information we can get on that position between now and the meeting would be beneficial. So yeah, Peter, I echo Poncho's request to see if you can get us a contact or something for that. Okay, we'll do. Thank you. All right, so we have uh, nine minutes left in the meeting. Um, I want to open the floor once more to comments from members of the public. Seeing that there are no um, hands raised, uh, I will uh, entertain a. Oh, please go ahead, Peter. Yeah. So I, I just before before you all leave, I just wanted to make sure I keep you updated on other work uh, that's uh, going to come forward uh, in the near future that may overlap with the work you're doing. Um, so as you probably know, after the um, the protests in spring of 2020, the council provided a lot of direction to staff, um, kind of in various responses of which this this group was one, and then a number a number of other um, a number of other efforts. So as part of that direction, the council asked um, that staff commission uh, three independent reports on three different topics. Uh, one report was an af an independent after action report. Uh, for the city's response to the spring 2020 protests. Uh, the second one was a report that analyzes um, use of force policies and procedures in the police department. And the third one was a report that um, analyzes uh, the police department's implementation of uh, 21st century policing practices. And those came out of a a task force that was established by the Obama administration, the series of recommendations for um, policing. Um, so those three reports are going to be made public this Friday. Uh, so I will make sure to pass those along to Chris when they're made public so he can distribute them if you if you want to review. Um, there are a number of recommendations in them. I think some of the subject matter may overlap with what you're looking at. So just wanted to make sure you know those are going to be available soon. And we anticipate that they'll come forward for the city council to accept them uh, on March 1st. Um, so I'll, I'll pass those along if there are any questions, happy to, happy to see if I can help. Thank you for sharing that information, uh, Peter. Poncho, please go ahead. Peter, is there, um, uh, are, are we going to have access, is there any chance we get access to those reports before March 1st? Are they going to, to uh, yeah. them talk to them already, talk, talk to them already? Or? They'll be, they'll be available this Friday. So I'll I'll send uh, Chris the link where they can be found when they're when they're posted on Friday. Uh, I'm sorry, Chris, but I got to do it. Uh, I will now entertain a motion to adjourn meeting. I'm sorry, I'm a stickler for these rules. So moved. Is there a second? I second. Second. All in favor of adjourning meeting, please raise your hand. All right. Um, all right, there we go. We have a majority vote. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for being here, and we'll see you in two weeks.